Um, good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well on this. Um, well, at least in San Diego, a gray May kind of day. Um, Dr. Clement will have to tell us what her weather's like, but um, I'm really excited to be able to introduce someone who I have met um, along my research and prep path. Um, and folks may remember Meredith, she did her fourth year, right? Fourth year of fellowship um, out here. So she was floating around um, San Diego and Dr. Hicks was always trying to see if he could get her to, to work for a period of time as well. Um, but she was busy working on getting her, her career going and ended up um, moving to the South. So I will tell you about her. Uh, Dr. Clement joined the LSU faculty in 2018 after completing her internal medicine and infectious diseases training at Duke University. Her academic interest lies in the prevention of HIV and sexually transmitted infections in vulnerable populations, including racial, ethnic, and gender minority populations in the South, with a particular focus on how to reduce the burden of HIV infection by maximizing the impact impact of PrEP. She has been involved in PrEP, re PrEP related research since 2014 and is currently studying the intersection of STIs and PrEP through a NIAID K23, K23 Career Development Award. Um, she's a great speaker. I think we're going to really enjoy this. So uh, let's welcome Dr. Clement by our <laughs> individually in our own spaces. Um, and I'll turn it over to you, Meredith, now. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Blumenthal. It's a, a dear friend and colleague uh, from way back when. And um, so, yeah, I'm very grateful to be here today. I want to talk about preventing STIs while ending the HIV epidemic, concordant goals in people living with and at risk of HIV. And the title is just to kind of get the point across that prevention and treatment of STIs and prevention and treatment of HIV kind of go hand in hand or concordant goals um, to improve the overall sexual health of our patients. And I think for many of us, that's our ultimate goal. Um, so if I can <laughs> advance my slides, here are my disclosures. Um, and then just to review the objectives of the talk briefly. So first I'm gonna review epidemiology of the STI and HIV syndemic. Um, the second objective is to discuss advances in STI prevention in the era of PrEP and U equals U. And then finally, I just want to talk about some of the local prevention efforts we have going on here in New Orleans um, and, and areas in the South uh, with a focus on some of my work related to my K23. So to review epi of STIs and HIV. So this is probably kind of obvious to many of you, but like I said, HIV and STIs have, have gone hand in hand really since the start of the HIV epidemic. Um, and that is because of kind of shared risk factors, so sexual networks, sexual partners, um, but also because of biological mechanisms at play. And so Judy Wasserheit published this article in, back in 1992. Um, she coined the term epidemiological synergy. And so she reviewed 75 articles that looked at the role of STDs in HIV transmission. And so I believe it was 15 of these articles controlled for behavioral risk factors. And what she found is that non-ulcerative and ulcerative STDs still um, were associated with a three to five increased risk of um, HIV transmission. And so what she kind of concluded is that if HIV or STDs facilitate transmission of HIV and HIV um, sort of augments the infectiousness of STDs, then these two epidemics can serve to amplify one another. So again, she termed, termed this, uh, this uh, phrase or, or this, this term she's called epidemiological synergy. And some other people have called this biological synergy, just these biological mechanisms at play. Um, but you know, the, the role of STDs influencing the genital mucosa and upregulating um, viral transmission. So, so there's a lot of research, dozens and dozens of studies have looked at these biological mechanisms and that could be a whole separate talk, um, but I'm not gonna belabor that today. Uh, instead, I'll move on to this study that was published by Dr. Kelly in 2015. So Colleen Kelly is a researcher, some of you may know at Emory. And I, I just include this study because it was published back when I was a fellow and I think was kind of one of these um, studies that just influenced my career trajectory and pathway kind of seeing um, the, the data that she published. So they looked um, at MS, men who have sex with men in Atlanta 
Um, and what she found was elevated rate ratios of HIV and STDs in black men who have sex with men compared to white men who have sex with men. And then when she looked specifically um, controlling for behavioral risk factors, looked specifically at the role of rectal STIs, um, she found um, an adjusted hazard ratio of 2.7. So that uh, increased HIV acquisition in the setting of rectal STIs. And then um, another uh, analysis that she did alongside this was to look at the population attributable fraction or PAF um, of rectal STIs on HIV acquisition and, and the numbers around 15. So 15% 15 of HIV um, incident infections really being directly attributable to the presence of a rectal STI in these men who have sex with men in her Atlanta cohort. Um, and so kind of that's just one study that shows this close relationship between HIV and STIs. Um, but what we've seen actually over the past few years is this decoupling or disassociation of HIV and STIs in terms of epidemiology. So here is recent, our recent CDC data, um, just kind of showing, you know, syphilis on the rise in the past few years, chlamydia on the rise in the past few years, gonorrhea on the rise. And here's HIV has kind of stagnated or, or just been stable in terms of rates. Um, for the past few years. And so a number of us in the field, I think hopefully rightfully so, um, attribute this kind of stagnation um, or lack of continued increase uh, to treatment as prevention or kind of the, the message that we try to get out to patients, U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable, um, and also PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And so you can kind of always count on San Francisco Department of Health um, to come up with these like catchy little um, cartoons and slogans, but really just to kind of show you guys, um, there's no, no um, transmission of HIV in people who have undetectable viral loads and that PrEP is incredibly effective at preventing HIV among folks who are HIV um, negative, but at risk for HIV infection. Um, and so here are some recent RCTs. This is just a few cities around the world looking at the combined power of targeted PrEP and treatment as prevention. So in San Francisco, 51% reduction in HIV rates in recent years, Seattle, 42% reduction, London, 42% reduction, Sydney, 32% reduction. And I just have to give a quick credit for this slide um, to Rafi Landovitz, who I'm sure many of you know, but is a friend and colleague at UCLA close to where you guys are. Um, and so, you know, what's heartening or what's exciting to us here in Louisiana is that we've seen these trends here too. Um, as some of you know, the South tends to lag behind in many, many different ways as far as HIV prevention and treatment. Um, but actually with our 2018 data, we saw for the first time in Louisiana um, that the annual um, number of HIV diagnoses was less than a thousand. And that was the first time really since before Katrina that we had seen that number and continued declines in 2019. So again, really exciting for us here across the world um, exciting news in terms of HIV treatment and prevention strategies. And then meanwhile, uh, let me uh, kind of hide my thumbnail so I, I can see my whole slide here. Um, but, uh, but in the meantime, STDs on the rise. And so I think many of us are familiar with this data. This slide was just released by the CDC last month, um, but 2.6 million cases of diagnosed syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea in 2019. And that was the sixth consecutive year that we've had record-breaking STD cases in the United States. Um, sorry, my slides aren't advancing. So why should we care? So I don't have time. I'm sorry to show you this funny clip from Saturday Night Live, but I would encourage you if you have um, some extra time on your hands this weekend to go to YouTube or wherever uh, and watch this. It's it's Pete Davidson and Colin Jost, but they're really saying like, you know, STDs are on the rise, but who cares? They're treatable. I take some pills. I get a shot. I'm cured. You know, I move on with my life. So again, if you have some time, feel free to watch that clip. But I just do want to talk about why I think we should care um, and, and name a few reasons specifically. So STIs are expensive, $16 billion a year. Um, and that is not even including uh, missed days of work and other kind of indirect impact. Um, increased HIV transmission, even in the setting of PrEP. So this study was published in CID in 2014 by Solomon and colleagues. Um, but what you can see here is this independent um, effect of syphilis 
in um, being associated with HIV acquisition, not just in the placebo arm, but in the, the Truvada or sorry, FTC TDF arm as well. Um, and so even in a PrEP study, even when um, patients were randomized to the PrEP arm, what you see is, is an increased risk uh, in, um, in HIV acquisition as related to syphilis. And, and I don't show this slide here, but there was similar data from the DISCOVER trial where even, again, in the PrEP study, those who acquired HIV were more likely to have an STI diagnosis. Um, and so then finally, my third point here is just that uptake of PrEP and TASP have been slow, especially in the South. And so I think that these um, high rates of STIs will continue to drive rates of HIV infection, particularly in places where I live, where uptake of PrEP and, and treatment as prevention have been slow. And so here's a map, um, California, whoops, sorry, um, green looking pretty good. Here's North Carolina where I was for seven years, dark red. Here's um, New Orleans and Louisiana where I live now. And, um, and as many of you know, kind of whatever the, the worst color is on the legend in these types of maps, the South usually tends to fall in that category. So we have struggled with PrEP uptake and I think um, it just makes kind of the, these increasing rates of STIs kind of all the more critical um, as we try to end the HIV epidemic. So why are we seeing these elevated rates of STIs? Um, and again, this could be a whole lecture in and of itself, um, but drug use, poverty, stigma, unstable housing. And I think we'll also need to add COVID-19 to this list um, when we see um, more recent data of what um, STI rates are doing currently. And then this has been a big topic of discussion recently, but cuts to STD programs at state and local levels um, contribute to kind of shortages of staff or um, cutback in hours or clinic closures. And so all this, as, as many of you probably know, has been truly exacerbated by the COVID uh, pandemic where there has been reallocation of public health staff, DIS, disease intervention specialists, um, to contact tracing efforts for COVID. So you had a, a program that was already struggling um, in terms of kind of a, a public health crisis, and then you add a pandemic to it. Um, and I think we're really going to see repercussions of that down the road as far as STD control. Um, and then now just moving on, I want to talk about decreased condom use for a minute, because this has been a hot topic for a while. Um, so Dr. Blumenthal and Halbert publish this article asking, will risk compensation accompany pre-exposure prophylaxis back in 2014? Um, and for anybody who's not familiar with risk compensation, it's this concept um, that you if that uh, a population or individuals will increase um, their risk-taking behaviors when they have a perceived risk reduction um, based on an intervention. So if bikers start using helmets, they're gonna drive their bikes fast, faster or more quickly and be more reckless. Or um, if people who inject drugs are gonna um, be offered clean needles, they're gonna use more drugs. Um, and so as far as PrEP, it's basically asking if we offer PrEP to patients or, or persons at increased risk of HIV, um, are they going to have more sexual partners? Are they going to use condoms less frequently, et cetera? So we've been asking this question for a while. Um, I just looked back at 2020 um, articles recently, and apparently we're still asking this question. So, you know, are there changes in sexual behaviors among men who have sex with men who are in a PrEP study, et cetera? But so it, this, this question continues to get debated and studied. Um, and I, did, I do want to highlight one study from 2019 that I think um, is just, uh, it encourages us to be more thoughtful about HIV prevention, or I'm sorry, STI prevention in the setting of PrEP. Um, and so this, um, this study was looking at a cohort of PrEP users in Australia. It was about 1,500 participants, uh, 3,200 person years of follow-up, and 3,000 STI diagnoses. So the incidence was about 92 STIs per 100 person years. And so what the authors found, though, that I think is very interesting is that about a quarter of the participants were um, uh, 
associated with 20, I'm sorry, 76% of all incident STIs during the study. And these were younger participants. Um, they were having more group sex and they, they just kind of did this careful um, look at the risk factors um, within this, this particular group. And I think it just encourages us to be more thoughtful about who we're trying to reach specifically for STI prevention um, within uh, cohorts of PrEP users. Uh, but I, I also want to highlight this um, kind of perspective piece from Dr. Molina and colleagues, uh, encouraging us to move on from this um, concept of risk compensation and really think about giving PrEP a chance. Again, risk compensation has been studied sort of ad nauseum. And in at least in my humble opinion, I think it's time to move on and really embrace PrEP. And here's just a couple of reasons why. So the, um, this study was published by Sam Jenis and colleagues back in 2017. Um, but what they, they it's a, a modeling study as you can see, but basically the idea is that if we can increase PrEP coverage, um, and thereby increase testing rates of STIs, then this can sort of um, make up for even if there is risk compensation, um, it can compensate, so to speak, for that. And we actually still might be able to re overall reduce gonorrhea and chlamydia infections in, in the populations using PrEP. And, and this kind of is predicated on the idea that people get tested quickly and are, are treated quickly. So there's not this ongoing transmission. Um, but again, this idea is you, you can test more frequently, you treat more frequently, and you prevent ongoing transmission. And, and they've actually modeled this and shows, shown that it can have a benefit. Um, another reason uh, to embrace PrEP, again, in my opinion, is that um, there have been studies that shown that gay and bisexual men have decreased sexual anxiety when they're taking PrEP. So I think that idea can be celebrated in and of itself. Um, and, and it's just, a, again, just one more reason that I think it's okay to embrace PrEP um, and kind of think about, well, if there are these increased rates of STIs, whether it's because um, we're detecting them more often, or it's truly risk compensation, you know, let's just think harder about STI prevention strategies. So now here I want to move into um, advances in STI prevention in the recent era of PrEP and U equals U. Uh, so here is some historical STI prevention strategies. Um, behavioral interventions are probably the most well studied over time. Um, partner services uh, have been looked at, test and treat strategies, again, kind of this idea that we can um, test and treat more frequently to prevent ongoing transmission, um, vaccines and microbicides, and then, excuse me, kind of these age-old strategies of condoms and, and circumcision. So this is what we've had in our toolbox. This, I think, is where we're going and what's been studied in, in the more recent past. And all of these have been augmented by kind of tech, M health apps and telehealth. And so I'll just spend a few minutes talking about that now. Um, and first, just to talk about behavioral interventions and, and specifically peer support. Um, so this study was published in 2012. This was 1,100 Black men who have sex with men. Um, and what the authors of this study found um, that homophobia, racism, financial hardship, and lack of social support were all associated with condomless anal intercourse in these Black men who have sex with men. Um, and, and then low, lack of social support was also sort of a mediator here too. Um, but the, the article is interesting and kind of what the authors talk about in their discussion is that this, this sense of social isolation among Black MSM um, the, is, is fueling and perpetuating health disparities because Black men who have sex with men feel ostracized or sort of isolated from their white men who have sex with men counterparts because of their race. And then they feel isolated from black communities because of their sexual relationships. So um, just kind of highlighting this lack of social support is something that needs to be addressed. Um, and so this uh, it was a um, study published by Sarah Legrand, who's one of my mentors at Duke um, back, uh, I guess, seven years ago, almost now. Um, she did focus group discussions with black men who have sex with men. And so what she found was that feelings of social isolation and, and lack of a sense of community were strongly endorsed, um, that lack of opportunities for social engagement were present, um, but desired, and that 
these these participants were actually very eager to have a social networking intervention um, that would reduce social isolation and they wanted opportunities not for meeting sexual partners but but for meeting friends and building a sense of community and so she's worked together with lisa hightow weidman um, who some of you are probably familiar with at unc um, on this uh, mobile optimized online intervention called health empowerment um, and the idea is to offer peer support through an online intervention um, the they did a randomized controlled study um, where half the participants were randomized to receive health empowerment and engage with it and the other half just got uh, no intervention um, and what they found actually was within the treatment group the episodes of condomless anal intercourse were reduced um, and statistically significantly reduced at three months although um, unfortunately the effect wasn't sustained over time um, but just kind of one example of peer support intervention. Uh, so to move on to novel partner services now, um, so tellyourpartner.org, it's an anonymous platform to tell sexual partners that they've been exposed to an STI and encourage them to get tested and treating, treated. So you can go online, you can um, fill out this form, you can add kind of a number of sexual partners. Um, again, you do this anonymously and you tell them they you know have been exposed to chlamydia syphilis or gonorrhea um, and again they're encouraged to get um, tested and treated okay and now to to briefly cover test and treat with rapid diagnostics um, so grinder i think adam for adam daddy hunt um, a number of these online um, networking sites have forged partnerships with health departments in recent years. And so this is just one example of how Grindr specifically um, helped uh, control a syphilis outbreak in West Virginia. So this was back a few years ago, but um, the uh, there was a syphilis outbreak in Morganton, West Virginia. And so Grindr sent alert messages to all Grindr users within a 50 mile radius of Morganton. And they didn't do any sort of, um, I guess, robust analysis, but, but kind of anecdotally the nurses um, who were working at the STD uh, uh, sexual health centers reported that they had kind of this increase in clients coming in for testing and treatment saying, you know, Grindr told me I needed to come in. So just one example of how um, how these networking apps can be useful in helping to control the um, STD uh, epidemic. Um, this is another study looking at rapid diagnostics. So this is the Dean Street Clinic in the UK. Um, and they automated their results and notification system uh, via SMS texting. And what they found was that the mean time to notification of part of a clients diagnosed with who had um, positive STD results uh, decreased from around eight days to about one day. And so you take the provider out of it and you actually see some results. Um, and again, this, this kind of more rapid um, notification and treatment is, is thought to be very beneficial at reducing community-wide rates because um, of, of this prevention of ongoing transmission. And so now I'll spend a few times, a few minutes talking about um, biomedical interventions. So some of you may be familiar with this study. This was a, a retrospective case-controlled study in New Zealand looking at the vaccine campaign against um, group B uh, meningo or using the group B meningococcal vaccine. And so here is just based on birth year, kind of the proportion of those vaccinated um, as a part of the campaign. And then here's looking at the case control analysis. So the controls were persons, were cases of uh, chlamydia um, and the cases were uh, cases of gonorrhea. And, and what they saw is that the, the, those who were vaccinated had a significantly less lower likelihood of being cases versus controls. And so the authors here, I think uh, here's kind of just the, the punchline here, but the authors concluded that the meningitis B vaccine was 31% effective against um, gonorrhea. And so as some of you know, uh, there's now studies, randomized controlled trials looking at meningitis B vaccine um, to prevent uh, 
gonorrhea. And actually one of the studies, um, LSU is a site uh, looking at Bexero. Um, and then here I wanna talk about antibiotic prophylaxis for just a minute. So the Ebergay open label extension or uh, OLA study um, was looking at doxypep post-exposure prophylaxis in participants who had been a part of Ebergay. Um, they were considered to be high risk men who have sex with men um, with no contraindication to doxy. And they were randomized to either receive um, on-demand PEP with doxy um, 24 hours after sex or up to 72 hours after sex or no PEP. Um, and there were 232 participants. They were followed for about nine months. And what you can see here is a, um, a, a, the first occurrence of syphilis and chlamydia um, was lower in the PEP group relative to the no PEP group in, in both, of, um, both of these. Whereas in gonorrhea, there was no difference. And that was um, to be expected based on doxy resistant rates of gonorrhea in France. Um, and then there was an overall impact too, kind of attributed to the syphilis and chlamydia. Um, declines. And so now uh, Dr. Molina and colleagues are pursuing a um, open label prospective cohort study. Um, their goal is to enroll 700 um, participants. I think I, I just got an update. They're at about 100. So you can sort of ignore these timelines here. I think everything lately has been a little disrupted by COVID, but this is an interesting study design. It's a factorial design where it's two to one doxy PEP versus no PEP, and then one to one um, meningitis um, B or no um, meninge B vaccine, and they'll look at STI incidence over time. And then um, there's a similar study that's happening currently in Seattle and San Francisco. This study, Dr. Kellum just told me, is about 30% enrolled. Um, it's 780 participants who will be enrolled, 390 um, without HIV, but on PrEP, um, and then another 390 um, persons with HIV. And so uh, two to one, similarly, uh, to doxy PEP versus no PEP, and then they'll look at the incidence of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. And, and this here, I think, just highlights um, these bullets, why this study is important and why we need to do these studies. Um, I, I know I've heard anecdotes in the community that people are, are using doxy PEP in their patients who have recurrent STIs, um, but I think it's important to do a study really looking at this in a controlled way um, because we, we don't know the negative impacts of, of prescribing doxy in this way. Um, so the study will do resistance testing. Um, they'll use CRISPR methods uh, for chlamydia and syphilis um, that uh, can be cultured. And then um, they will look at stool samples in 100 participants uh, who um, yeah, we'll provide stool samples to look at uh, the microbiome and the impact there. And then finally, they'll do some um, tetracycline uh, hair testing to look at adherence to doxycycline in the study. And so um, I kind of want to wrap up this section just by mentioning this um, review that was published by Jeannie Morazzo, who's at UAB, Julie Jombrowski at UW, and Ken Mayer um, at Fenway, uh, that if anybody is kind of interested in this issue of STI prevention in the era of U equals U and, and PrEP, um, some of the pressing key research questions that need to be addressed uh, in the next few years. And so one, um, for, for non-TDF FTC PrEP regimens, can inflammation facilitate breakthrough replication that could overcome the effect of PrEP or promote risk of HIV or STI transmission. Um, and so fortunately, we know um, that, that this is not the case for TDF FTC, that, um, that we don't see um, this effect um, here. Uh, just some other pressing questions, implementation science and study design wise, um, what will be the economic and workforce implications of increase in STI testing um, we will continue to see with expanding use of PrEP. And can SCIs integrate the provision of PrEP as part of their menu of services? 
Um, and then finally, how can we leverage HIV prevention studies using factorial, de factorial design strategy to layer on STI prevention interventions? So I just circled these as kind of the most important questions in my mind. Some we're doing some work locally to address these. Some of the studies I've mentioned have addressed some of these questions. But again, I think this review might be worth um, looking at for anyone who's kind of interested in this in this field. Um, and so finally now I want to spend some time talking about local STI and HIV prevention efforts um, where I am in New Orleans, some of the work we've done in Durham, North Carolina, um, and again to, to talk about my K23 for a minute. So um, this was a study we just published last year. We had a, a prep cohort in North Carolina um, that uh, was both the prep patients from an academic center and our federally qualified health center. Um, and I, I just kind of highlight this because we were able to look at STI incidents in this study. Um, we also looked at discontinuation of care, which was quite high, like disturbingly high. Um, but we were able to, it, I would say it probably wasn't the most robust analysis, but we had enough participants that we were able to look at STI incidents and factors associated with STIs. And, and really the only important thing was a baseline STI as you kind of might expect anyway. Um, and, and so that study sort of um, laid the groundwork, even though I moved to New Orleans um, and transferred my K with me um, to kind of some of the work we're doing among Black MSM here um, who are taking PrEP to think again more thoughtfully about STI prevention. And so I, I spent some time talking about Pierce or sorry, um, social isolation and lack of peer support as drivers of sexual risk taking among Black MSM. Um, but as many of you know, Black MSM, um, men who have sex with men, are a, a demographic group at greatest risk, risk of sexual health disparities um, here in the U.S. So this grant is really to focus on that group and, and again, think um, or, or more thoughtfully consider STI prevention. Um, so for AIM-1, uh, we have a cohort of Black men who have sex with men who are prescribed PrEP, and the idea is longitudinally to, to determine incidents and predictors of STIs. Um, AIM-2 is a qualitative in nature, so it's, it, it's in-depth interviews and focus group discussions with Black MSM prescribed PrEP, some with recent STI history, others without a recent has, STI history. Um, and the idea is to understand drivers of sexual risk. So to look at facilitators and barriers to risk reduction practices and to think about M health as uh, peer support as a potential facilitator. Um, and then AIM-3 is a Black MSM, um, a cohort of Black MSM um, with predictors of STIs. So, so based on any um, uh, factors associated with STI incidents, um, based on AIM-1 analyses, look uh, specifically at Black MSM with those risk factors um, and test this mHealth peer support app, um, at whether it can reduce risk behaviors and, and thereby reduce STI incidents. Um, and so for AIM-1, our idea was to enroll 100 Black MSM. Um, COVID has disrupted things a bit, and we will probably only get to 65 or 70. Um, but I just wanted to give a little bit of data for the first 50 that we have enrolled, um, average of 27 years of age. Um, again, all self-identified as Black MSM. Um, but 4% Hispanic, 10% multi multiracial, um, high rates of insurance, and that's probably related to being in Louisiana, we're sort of an outlier in the fact that we have um, Medicaid expansion here. And then here is the income breakdown, um, but about a third have an income of less than 15,000 per year. 30% um, have two to four sexual partners in the last three months. Uh, another 30% have um, more than or equal to five sexual partners in the past three months. And 22% report um, never using condoms. 50% had at baseline a reported STI diagnosis in the past 12 months. And then um, related to kind of the hypothesis driving all of this um, is their social isolation scores, 33, um, which is a little bit higher. It, the range is 10 to 40. So this is with 40 being very good um, social support. And so uh, the, it's a little bit higher than we would have expected. And, and my thought is maybe that, that Black MSM who uh, have taken steps to, to get PrEP 
um, maybe have a greater sense of empowerment at, and more social support. And that's why these scores are a little higher. Um, but the idea with this study is to look at STI incidents over time and then hopefully factors associated with STI incidents, although um, it's likely we might end up being a little underpowered for that analysis. Um, the next aim is to uh, do in-depth interviews with men who have sex with men, really to ask the question, do you care about an STI diagnosis? Um, what is the so social or sexual context around risk reduction practices? And what are some prevention strategies you would be um, willing to engage in or that you find appealing beyond just condom use? And so uh, just a quick quote from Dr. Morazzo again at UAB, but um, condoms aren't doing the trick. What would people use? What is acceptable? So that's part, so the analysis is, is in, or the um, methods were informed um, by this health belief model. And, and so we asked specific questions, again, around the, the context of sexual risk taking, but also um, perceived susceptibility of STIs and severity, benefits and barriers um, to prevention. And um, we also asked specifically, as per the quote by Dr. Morazzo, what their preferences are for STI prevention. And so we've done 24 interviews at this point with Black MSM on PrEP. 12 with an STI in the past year, 12 without an STI in the past year, and, and we'll actually presenting, be presenting some of those results at the STI and HIV World Congress meeting um, in July. So that's exciting. Uh, aim 2B is focus group discussions to kind of think about how an mHealth app that offers peer support um, might be modified with STI prevention features um, to impact uh, STI rates and, and risk reduction practices. So this is 2B, but the idea is to use the app in AIM-3. Um, and so this is a partnership with University of Virginia. They have an app called Prept um, that we're modifying um, for the context of New Orleans um, and building in STI prevention features. So this is the Mississippi Bridge. Um, we just kind of added some photographs to jazz up the app a little bit. Um, but the app has always had check-ins um, to assess like daily stress levels, um, and uh, and mood and that sort of thing, but we've added a check-in. Um, you know, did you have sex last night or yesterday? Did you use a condom yesterday? And so folks can kind of track that over time. And here's a calendar. Um, there's also going to be a feature where they can kind of enter in the details. Um, and so if they did get diagnosed with an STI, they could sort of look back um, over the past uh, time frame and kind of see well, who are the partners I need to identify um, and notify um, to inform them of this STI diagnosis. And then now, and, and again, so we'll be studying this um, app in a pilot uh, for AIM-3 as a K. Um, and so then now I do want to spend just a little bit of time talking about some of the other things we're doing in New Orleans um, to focus on STI and HIV prevention work. Um, so efforts to enhance PrEP uptake among Black women. Um, we are going to be implementing rapid PrEP at our sexual health center. Um, we have efforts underway, or I should say a program underway, um, to provide teleprep, uh, which, you know, certainly under the context of the pandemic, I think is even um, more useful. And then lastly, I'll just talk about our recent uh, study that we presented at CROI, um, using electronic health record based um, HIV uh, risk prediction models. So here is um, just this study. This was a CFAR supplement. I know Dr. Blumenthal, I believe, had a, one of these um, ending the HIV CFAR supplements. Uh, there was a award, um, a, folks were awarded in 2019 and 2020. So this for us was our 2019 award, um, which we call Getting to None in NOLA, um, enhancing PrEP uptake among Black women to end the HIV epidemic. And so we recruited Black women to provide thoughts on facilitators and barriers to PrEP uptake. And the idea was to develop locally informed strategies to improve uptake among Black women. And so we did in-depth interviews with 25 cisgender women. Um, 13 of them were taking PrEP. Uh, Two, 22 had Medicaid, two had private insurance, and one was uninsured. Again, I think this speaks to the Louisiana Medicaid um, expansion um, uh, 
program here, and then 23 had been sexually active uh, in the past six months. And so here is just some of here are some of the quotes um, that they told us. Um, and and basically, I think the gist of this is they they they're aware of prep. Um, the black cisgender women that we interviewed, but they weren't aware of it as a HIV prevention strategy for themselves. Um, so this one here, it wasn't no one particular thing, but mostly for gay people and people who are sexually promiscuous in their life like that. And then I haven't really heard of any black women talk about being on prep ever. Um, and the, based on the commercials and the advertisements, it didn't really seem that it was geared toward women. So I didn't really think that it, I didn't think of it very well. And then we asked if they were gonna go on PrEP, where would they want to receive it? And they weren't interested in teleprep, but they were interested in getting it at the sexual health clinic. And so many of these women were recruited from a sexual health clinic. And so um, they, they had existing relationships with the providers there or from a women's care specialist, their gynecologist, or from a primary care provider. And, and the idea is that these providers were knowledgeable, appropriate, and, and basically that they felt comfortable with them. Um, and so, you know, I think I would probably do the gynecologist um, and, or I'd just go to the sexual disease clinic. Um, and so um, based on the results of these, the data from these interviews, um, we're pursuing um, subsequent funding, hopefully, to, uh, to, to um, for an intervention that, that would be both provider level um, and client level. So we would work with gynecologists to train them to, to start the conversation around PrEP um, and encourage them to prescribe PrEP for women who want it. And then a social media campaign to not just raise awareness about PrEP, but raise Black women's awareness that that prep is for them through kind of video testimonials um, and and a, again a social media campaign. And then now I'll just talk for a minute about our uh, rapid prep program um, that we're trying to implement at the LSU Crescent Care Sexual Health Center. Um, so the way it exists in New Orleans right now. Um, is that uh, this is the Marine building. It's about a mile from our safety net hospital. Um, but on the fifth floor is a sexual health center and, and clients come in for the sexual, to the sexual health center for STI screening and treatment. And then they get referred to the Crescent Care. Crescent Care is a, a very large federally qualified health center here in New Orleans um, to the prep clinic um, for prep care. And here is sort of what we found based on 2019 data. So out of 35, more than 3,500 clients, only 230 were referred for PrEP um, and only 100 attended their initial visit. And if you kind of look at that even more closely, um, it's fewer attended a subsequent visit. And, and when actually we looked at the numbers of those who, who didn't attend or those who didn't attend a subsequent visit, um, about a third of them had a recurrent STI clinic visit within the year. So um, this, I think this, this whole uh, drop off in referrals really makes the case for providing rapid prep or immediate prep um, at our prep clinic. And, um, and I've actually spoken with Dr. Little, Dr. Honegal about their processes and they've been really helpful for us trying to figure out um, how to implement rapid prep here in New Orleans at our um, at our STI clinic on the fifth floor. Um, but we we did recently get a, a small implementation science grant from IPAC to look at how to do this more thoughtfully in terms of having a limited impact on um, the flow workflow of the clinic uh, and how to do this in a way. Um, that is acceptable to both providers and clients. And so the idea is to, to start implementing that uh, later this year. Um, so same day prep services when patients come in and, and really to avoid, avoid this drop off. And, and we have subsequently done more analyses and it looks like probably 500 were already on prep and about 40 to 50 of these um, patients were living with HIV. But really, kind of why we're missing so many in terms of actual referrals uh, is something we want to study more closely and hopefully address uh, in this grant. 
And then, so the Louisiana Teleprep program, um, I'll touch on for just a second. So the Louisiana Department of Health uh, started this program back in 2019 um, with the idea of really trying to reach folks who live in rural communities of Louisiana uh, for PrEP. And so um, this is just kind of an initial look at their data, um, but we, we helped, um, our team at LSU kind of helped um, look at this and analyze it and write this up. And, and actually it was presented at AIDS 2020 last July. Um, but of you know more than 300 clients who inquired about it, um, ultimately less than 100 started on PrEP. And so just trying to uh, identify ways to, to avoid these drop-offs in the continuum of care. Um, but also just to be excited that, that this program even exists, it's an initiative by the Louisiana Department of Health. Um, and it has reached clients in all nine of these um, regions of Louisiana. Um, so it has reached patients in rural population, uh, in rural um, communities as well. And then I guess I'll close just by talking about uh, what we presented at CROI um, just, I guess that was a few months ago now, um, but, but I worked together with some Duke colleagues um, to, uh, to, to create this HIV risk prediction model using electronic health record data. Um, so the Duke catchment area is fairly large. Um, our analysis or our, our patient cohort was any patient seen at Duke, oops, sorry, um, between 2014 and 2018. So we had 1.6 million um, unique patients who were seen within DHS, with, which is the Duke Health System. Um, 368 patients had an incident HIV diagnosis and 93 of them were women. Um, so what kind of we found in terms of our results uh, was that this, this model that we developed using machine learning methods um, actually had pretty good performance at identifying those with, with incident infection. Um, so the area under the receiver operating curve was 0.96 for the total cohort and 0.95 for women and the average precision score, which I'm not super familiar with these to be honest, but I'm told they're pretty good, was 0.45 uh, for the total patient cohort and 0.27 for women. Um, and then we look specifically kind of at, at factors associated with incidents within the cohorts. Um, but the idea is that we use EHR-based data um, to develop this model. And then when we implement and roll out the model, that it will encourage providers um, to, to think about risk of HIV and then um, start PrEP or refer for PrEP. Um, and so we work together. Some of you may be familiar with the work of Julia Marcus and Doug Krakauer um, up at Harvard, um, but we work together with them um, to develop these because we were kind of um, emulating some of the work they had already done uh, in Kaiser and, and um, up in Massachusetts. Um, but what was exciting is that for these results, I think because the epidemic looks so different in the South and in North Carolina specifically, um, we were able to develop a separate model for women only that again had pretty reasonable performance um, and, and hopefully can be um, implemented and, and utilized to think about candidates for PrEP who are, are, are cisgender women. Because as many of you know, it's often kind of a nuanced um, uh, analysis of who has, which women are truly at risk for HIV. And so we're, we're hopeful that this, this model can do a better job of what we have currently um, at identifying um, cisgender women who will be good candidates for PrEP. Um, and I think with that, I'll, I'll close. Um, I talked about how HIV and STIs go hand in hand. There have been a recent dissociation or decoupling um, but I hope I've kind of, and sorry, this is a little bit corny, but I hope I, I've, I've convinced you that together we can think about STI and HIV prevention and tre treatment strategies um, kind of in concordance um, so that we can um, really more thoughtfully consider the sexual health of our patients. And so um, I think that's my last slide. I'll say thank you to some of my colleagues. This is my daughter who went to the Pride Parade pre-COVID she was actually born in San Diego. So um, anyway, without 
I, and I think anything further, I'll just kind of close um, and try to bring back my um, pictures here so I can see whoever's talking. But yeah, I'm happy to take questions. Meredith, thank you so much for such a comprehensive and uh, really thought-provoking talk. You really got through a lot of data and still left us with some time. Um, there are a few uh, questions or comments and questions in the chat, which it looks like you're looking at now. Um, I can read them so that the rest of the group can hear it while you're while you're thinking about it. Um, so this is from Dr. Nettie Aldis. She is um, the clinic director um, at one of our, our big federally qualified health centers um, in the South Bay. I'm curious if there are new test options of in-clinic rapid STI testing and the barriers to implementation. Current system of testing and then chasing folks down to come back for treatment is clearly suboptimal for public health and patients and time consuming for clinic staff. If you have suggestions. You can email her, but also to your thoughts now. No, I mean, I think it, it's a great question and it's it's a topic of a lot of conversation and study. And that there we, you know, we should have rapid diagnostics um, sooner rather than later because they're being studied. So um, and you know, some of them already in place, but maybe a little bit harder to access. Um, but I'd I'd love to email you and kind of keep this conversation going. We're doing some of these studies um, at our LSU. Uh, sexual health center that I showed on the fifth floor of our marine building. We do a lot of diagnostic studies there. So I, I'm happy to, I'll, I'll copy down your email address and we can kind of keep the conversation going. That would be great. I mean, I just am not familiar with the technologies available and I'm thinking, well, you know, we, I'm sure we could think of, of some grant opportunities, but um, I'm not familiar with a lot of other clinics doing it, um, but it just seems like why at this day and age are we still being like come back or we'll call you back or it's Thursday and we diagnosed you on Monday and you had a weekend to share your STD. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. And there there are some of those. Yes, it's 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 coming. So I'll we'll we'll continue the conversation. Thanks for your question. Well actually and I don't know if if Sheldon, I see he's still on the call and I don't mean to put you on the spot. Um, but I know you're always aware of various you know, new diagnostics, um, anything that you'd want to um, share with the group related to that? Sure. I, mean, I mean, we did the pivotal study for one of these, which is a point of care NAT disposable um, self-contained device, which would be, and they were, and was, they were going for FDA application just last year. So I, I kind of, I don't, I think what happened was all the, the diagnostic companies, right, can now have moved to COVID or, or all of a sudden tried to move COVID. So that's what they did and got the emergency approval for their, their rapid COVID. And then, and then all the SDI stuff that we were doing, because we wanted to do, build on that platform, uh, have dissipated a bit. So uh, I, just as you said that, I'm, I'm trying to look them up and see like, hey, whatever happened to you guys? I thought we were all close to FDA approval, <laughs> you know? Um, so I'm hoping, so I was still hopeful that they, that'll come through. I feel like that's the point of these rounds to remind people to do things that they thought they were going to do. <laughs> so. That is the point of this round. Also, I, I'm in this like kick right now, you know, I've been doing COVID all year, but I'm really in this mindset where we need to take all the COVID momentum and money and infrastructure and all these things we built up around COVID and not just like dump it and go, okay, moving on. Like, let's take it and apply it to tuberculosis and STIs and all that. So we actually have to jump on it now before everybody loses attention and the money dries up and all that. But there's a lot of infrastructure that's been built around COVID and new diagnostics and all of that. And we can just apply that to STIs if we push it now, you know? Yeah. And somebody else may know more details. Somebody else on the, on the Zoom may know more details than I do. Um, but uh, I think just one, just recently there was an allocation of 1.3 billion to public health infrastructure, um, I guess, under the Biden administration uh, for kind of being allocated to STI clinics. Um, so I'll, I'll look at that email too. I'll, I'll email that to you too. I'll look at the specifics of it. But I think, you know, I think COVID has, has done nothing if not highlight um, kind of these inequities in care and just this crisis in public health that we're having. Um, and, and really, again, STI control, I think, uh, has suffered immensely because of it. 
Yeah, and Dr. Benson notes that Roche is also working on a rapid point of care combined test for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and mycoplasma that will be useful in the clinic. Clinical trials are underway. Um, so Dr. Little, I don't know if you wanna unmute and just chat if you're still there. Yeah. I am still here. Um, what did I say? I said, um, uh, oh yeah. So I was just interested in the, um, you know, the people who have the disproportionate contribute to a disproportionate number of recurrent STIs. Um, and if there are any um, interventions, public health responses that are specifically being developed for that population of individuals, um, you know, enhanced partner services, behavioral interventions, you know, looking at more frequent scheduled um, testing, et cetera. Yeah. And so I guess the short answer is I, I'm not really sure that there are these interventions. If you ask me, that's what we should be doing. And yeah. that's what I like it. <laughs> Um, because that JAMA article really kind of highlights that for all of us. And then, and then even just my small cohort from North Carolina, it's like, well, if you've had an STI before, you're the person who we should be trying to reach because you're most likely to have a recurrent STI. Um, right. So that's part of my K23 is to really focus on this group who's at higher risk, um, mainly because I think the intervention is more likely to be effective if we, you know, have an effect size that we can show. Um, but, uh, but so our work here will focus on that. I, I don't know that I can speak more broadly as to yeah. other focusing, but I do believe that it should, it should be right. Because that's just an obvious, you know, if you have, if you have a huge proportion of, of the, of prep cohorts that aren't having any STIs at all, why are you going to focus your STI prevention efforts on that, that group? And you really should focus on those at highest risk. So yes. I agree with you. I, no, you know. I have the same, I have the same sense here that it's a relatively small ish proportion that disproportionately contribute. And I'm, again, you, you know, I think one of the other things that wasn't directly highlighted, but I'm acutely aware of, there are not discrete funding resources for STI research, you have to bundle them and hide them within HIV <laughs> um, applications. So if you wanted to look at this question specifically, it's very hard to look at um, unless you can bury it within a, you know, a prep, it's very hard to look at. Right, right, I, I agree. And, and that's sort of what I did with my K, it's a STI prevention in the setting of HIV prevention. Right, exactly. Um, it looks like there's one other question um, from Sepid. I wonder if you have longitudinal, longitudinal testing rate data since you mentioned in 2018, the number of new diagnoses is less than a thousand for the first time. So I think probably talking about the Louisiana number of cases yeah. um, and, and how our testing rates, I think if anything, our, our sense is that we're testing more. I don't know, uh, but it's not a under testing, under diagnosis phenomenon. We, we think we're testing more and I, I'm sorry, I can't give you numbers on that. Um, and it'll be interesting again to see what 2020 data are in, in the context of COVID. But, um, but yeah, our sense is that we were testing more in 2018 and 2019. Okay, and I was told that someone had their hand raised and I missed it. Dr. Wagner, would you like to be the last question? It's 8.59, so I'll let you, you be the last word with Dr. Clement. Well, just thanks, uh, Meredith. That was really comprehensive and very informative, very helpful uh, for us all. Um, so any thoughts as to why Black women did not prefer telehealth for PrEP? I'm assuming that these are predominantly cisgender women. It was all it was all cisgender women, and I'm sorry if I wasn't clear about that. But um, it was it was 25 cisgender women. 13 were already taking prep. 12 were not, but they were all asked about preferences. And um, teleprep was not um, preferred because women wanted to to get prep from a provider they already felt comfortable with um, and had that re pre existing relationship with. So that's why I kind of they said I don't want teleprep. It's not personal enough. I want my sexual health provider or my, you know, gynecologist or PCP, someone I already know to talk to me about it and prescribe PrEP. And, and I will say we've looked at our telehealth PrEP data, teleprep data too. And, you know, we also have reasons everybody wants teleprep, right? And, and some of it is, is sadly 
that there's a, a refusal of PCPs here to provide PrEP. Um, and a lot of it is related to privacy concerns. So, you know, I think it goes both ways. And that's why kind of just like injectable cavitegravir or linocapavir, you know, all the other PrEP 2.0 in the pipeline, um, we, not, we don't just need like different drug strategies, we need different implementation strategies because different people want different things. So thanks for that question. Sorry, thanks Meredith so much. It's nine o'clock, just wanted to be respectful of your time and everyone else's time. Um, you can see the praise in the chat. This was just, this really was so fabulous and expected so nothing less. Um, uh, we really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to chat with us about the work that you're doing and, and your thoughts in this area. Yeah, and I, you know, we're always looking for collaboration. So if anybody ever wants to reach out, I think, I don't know, Jill, I, my email address and was on the last slide, but um, I'm, I'm also Googleable, but uh, we, we, I'd love to kind of talk to other people about strategies and I already kind of appreciate a lot of the work that you guys are doing in San Diego that's been so fantastic and, and helpful for us in many ways. So thanks so much. Bye, everybody. Have a great rest of the fr rest of Friday and a wonderful weekend. Yay. Okay. Bye, <laughs> Bye Meredith.